my aim of today was to talk to you guys about girls, sorry, about where I see health and fitness and why so many people are struggling with whatever it is that they're struggling. Because ultimately, you're all here to learn, get tips, get some inspiration to move yourself forward. Wherever you're at right now, you want to move forward. Whether it's from a knowledge perspective, a mindset perspective, a weight perspective, a career perspective, like all of this health and fitness stuff should lead us to better our lives. And that's why we're learning this stuff. And I see a lot of people struggling never to do the information. The information is never a problem. You all, I know, you know what healthy food is. Broccoli, it's a green vegetable, it's good for you. Crisps, not so great eating now and again. Pizza, pretty calorific, don't eat it too much, but everyone loves it. Alcohol, everyone loves it, don't have too much. You know, spinach, eat loads of that, it's really healthy. We know that shit, right? So what's everyone struggling with? So everyone's struggling with, usually, what's happening up here, all the voices and the, the social media and the Instagram this, and she's doing that, and she's doing something, and he's doing CrossFit, and whatever. And we're overcomplicating it for ourselves. So I go through several processes when I work with any individual. And there's two key things that I have to start with with every client. And I, I ask this up front and I say there's, there's two processes we're going to go through now. The first one is you are going to, from today, decide to up your standards. And as soon as you do that, you up your standards, you start to make very different choices around your health and your weight and your well-being and your career and your relationships, everything. If your standard for your health is here, you'll only ever live in between where you're at and where your maximum level of your standards have uh, are met. So we need to say, am I happy, willing and able to go up here? Because you'll start to take very different actions. You'll eat different food, you'll start to go to the gym when you're feeling tired, everything will change. When people ask me why I take certain decisions around my health, it's because my bar is set up here. I'm the guy that's willing to say, actually, I don't want another beer, or I don't want a slice of cake, or I don't want something that's not conducted to my goals if it doesn't fit in my level of standards. And that's important because people are here because we're limiting ourselves through potentially we don't value ourselves enough, the people around us don't support us. There's loads of reasons why your standards for your health are not high enough. I can't solve that for you today. But what you need to do is go away and say, why do I make the decisions that I make? Why do I think the way that I do? You need to start to unwind that. And that's where sometimes in a fitness journey, you do kind of need to isolate your, yourself a little bit for a period of time because you have to create the environment around yourself to succeed. So in health and fitness, and our daily lives, we need momentum. We have to have momentum. So think about your daily life and say, right, when I get up in the morning and I make a coffee, my breakfast, whatever, and then I get in the car and I go to work and I go about my day and I go to the gym and whatever you do, what happens throughout your day and when does your energy change? If you wake up in the morning and you feel like shit, that's a starting point we need to deal with. Why do you feel like crap? Work that out, start to make a plan. But when you start to wake up in the morning and you start to feel good about what's happening in yourself and up here you feel strong, if your day starts to deviate, then you need to ask why it deviates. You know when you go into like a restaurant or an airport and you walk out and they have those like four smiley faces, red, amber, and it's basically happy or sad. Imagine going through your day and having those buttons in front of you. Like you wake up, yeah, happy, sweet. Get to work, yeah, happy. And it gets to like 11 o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden you hit the unhappy button in your head. Why does that happen? Is it your work colleagues? Is it the people that you have to deal with? Is it maybe your gym? Maybe you, you, you kind of don't really feel that motivated at five o'clock when you walk into your gym because actually your gym isn't that great an environment. I bring this up because we need momentum because when we lose momentum and we start to feel low, 
that's when we make different choices. That's when we make potentially bad choices, self-sabotaging choices, because automatically someone else in the environment has brought our standards down. And it might be that you bring your standards down to the level of other people. And that's why environment is really important. The gym you go to could be make or break in your fitness journey. Imagine if you walk into every training session and you're like, I love the people here, I love the trainer, like the receptionist says hello, like I like coming to this place. If you don't get that, you're ruining your momentum. So when I get up in the morning, I'm fortunate, I work from home, I can shape a lot of my day. But everything in front of me allows me to keep that momentum. The food that's in my fridge, the actions that I take, the way that I think, everything. So from today, you need to start to maybe paint the picture of your day and say, where does my day go off course? Is it people? Is it environment? Is, is it my planning? Because then you can functionally fix that. You might not be able to instantly change jobs. I get that that might be difficult. It might be that long term you do need to change job. If you're not in a career that makes you happy, you have to change long term. It's eight, nine hours of our day. That's a significant chunk of your life. But it might be that you approach situations differently. If people fuck you off at work, can you approach that differently? Could you learn to deal with their character differently? A lot of people get annoyed with other people because we expect them to behave similarly to us. Well, other people aren't like you and me. I have staff, I have a team. They don't think like me. I have to understand how they behave so I can work with them and almost jump in front of them and anticipate how they're gonna react in any given situation. So this brings me on to my second point. Number one, we talked about upping your standards. Number two, I like to talk about extreme ownership. It's one of my favorite books, Extreme Ownership. If you've never read it, I highly recommend it. It's in my top five. It's written by two guys, Jacko Willink and Leif Babin. And basically, these are two military commanders that had the responsibility of thousands of troops um, in Afghanistan. And they'd, they'd be in control of you know, going out on patrols and literally going to war. And their perspective was, is if they drove down the road and a load of soldiers got blown up by an IED, they wouldn't go, oh, those pesky Taliban got us again. They'd be like, that's our fault. That's our fault those soldiers died. Why is it our fault? Okay, did we have bad intelligence? Did we not prepare properly? Did we not plan the route intelligently? Maybe the soldiers didn't have the right equipment. So they're always coming back to themselves at the top of the ladder. And you've got to understand you're at the top of the ladder. So every one of my clients has to appreciate that they are in control of where they're going. Everything. You're in control of the food that you eat, the choices that you make, the way that you exercise, the time you go to bed. Now there's some stuff that you're not in control of. I get that. But you're in control about how you react to it. If things annoy you, why do they annoy you? Could you change your reaction? We all know people that are like, stress comes in and it's like water off a duck's back. Like, Whoa. And there's some people, stress comes in, reaction. They're in fight mode, like, oh, that guy's an idiot. You know, you're slamming on the horn in the car and stuff. Why? You have to ask yourself that question because it never leads to a positive outcome. You disempower yourself by make, from making the right decision. You're not empowering yourself. So every one of my clients has to understand you are empowered to make a choice or change the way you view that situation and where you can move forward. So that's the starting point with all my clients. If we don't get that, where's your standard set and it needs to be high and you are in control, we're really starting at a disadvantage. And the diet plan that I give them, the training plan, the education, all that kind of stuff, is gonna fall apart at some point where their motivation dips down. You might get motivated from today. Yeah, be fit, saw some amazing people, watch Hazel Wallace spoke, Alice Living, Ben said some cool stuff, ate some great food, awesome. If you don't change what's in the way of your momentum, that motivation will not transform itself into habit. Motivation gets you started, habit, creates the results. So that's why I'm talking about your day and your environment. What needs to change? Does the gym need to change? Does your nutrition need to change? Does your bed need to change because it makes your back hurt? Like There's just loads of things that you need to break down because it's ruining your momentum as a high-performing person. I'm here to make you a high-performing person or at least realize 
the stuff that's not making your high performing person. So then we can start to create some tangible structure with this individual's nutrition. What's important with food and fitness, and this word is overused and I get it, but it needs to be sustainable and it needs to be balanced. How many of us have been through extreme phases of training and nutrition? You're all in, you're sugar free, you're caffeine free, you're alcohol free, you're detox this, you're rubbing lemon and salt in places that should have been, like, what the fuck? Ask yourself, if you get motivated from today, which is cool, if you start making different choices from right now today, and you wake up next week, and you hand on heart say, why am I doing this? Are these habits and things that I'm doing now as a result of BFIT gonna stick in 12 months time? You're setting yourself up for failure. So everything that I want you to do from today has to be doable, accessible, enjoyable for the foreseeable future. I'm a guy, I love beer. It's never gonna be out of my diet. But a nutritionist might look at me and say, beer's not great, alcohol's a bit of a toxin to the liver, and I'm like, right. Well, I'm only having four, five, six units a week, so chill out, otherwise pretty active, well hydrated, eat some good food. If that person did that to me and forced that on me, which many people enforce on themselves, alcohol-free, sugar-free, caffeine-free, fun-free, you're setting yourself up for failure. He's setting me up for failure, because the chances are I'll go alcohol-free for like three weeks and I'll be like, ah, and I'll just go and get shit first which we all do. We cut out bad food, we're great for three weeks, and then we go to a friend's house, and then you're like, oh, everyone else is doing it, fuck it. Yeah, I'll have three pizzas, please. So we've got to find out why we can't be sustainable. What are we trying to apply? What are we trying to achieve? If you can never see yourself calorie counting in your life, don't use a calorie counting approach. If you need to understand food, then perhaps you do need to count calories for a period of time because if you don't understand what's in your food, you're not empowered to make intelligent decisions. And that's from healthy food to unhealthy food. If you want to go out and have a glass of wine, cool, what's that impact calorically with that glass of wine? Know that it might be 150 calories a glass, awesome, that allows you to make decisions on how you can tweak the rest of your nutrition. Same with an avocado, it's got around 220 to 240 calories know that because it's information that can empower you that when you're preparing your salad you're like oh yeah cool that looks like 500 calories boom so i do think that everyone at some point has to understand their calorie intake whether you do that long term or not is completely up to you so i take clients through several different phases i give them a plan to start with i always give a client a plan that's because the client expects it so I want to build that bridge of trust between me and the client. Also, it allows us to use that momentum positively. So right now, you're all motivated. If I gave you all a seven-day diet plan, chances are a lot of you might go and follow it because your momentum is high. Your willingness to change is high. So I give my client the plan, and then I'm like, right, after the first week, you get no more plans. Then we start to learn. We start to learn why I've created these meals in maybe the way that I have. We start to talk about why there is certain balance at certain times of the day. We start to talk about your energy response from food. So if you have a really high carb lunch because there's tons of rice in it, why is that? Okay, maybe that's too much carbohydrate for you. We bring that down, we bring protein and fat up, and we help stabilize your blood glucose because you don't do that well on carbohydrates. So we get into this pattern and then we start to educate about what all these pieces mean. And then I generally have four layers of systems that I might use with the client. Level one is we try and just portion control our food. So you can use your fist, your hands, you can do a little bit of research on sensible portions, but we just try and eyeball it of what's healthy. That works to a degree, but it breaks down very quickly when we don't eat real foods because they're hypercaloric. If you go out and have a bit of a fun weekend, you could easily undo one to two weeks of fat loss having a fun weekend. Because the reality is a three course dinner might be 2,000 plus calories. And for many of you being female in the room but might be eating 1,800 to 2,600 calories a day, that's a whole day of food in one meal. I'm not demonizing having that meal, I'm saying we need to have awareness of the impact of that meal. 
So that's when these tools can break down. There's another level of tracking, and that's just having a look at your overall calorie intake. So not analyzing what's in those calories, just overall calories. So if I need 3,000 calories a day, I just count that intake. And that, for the most part, is gonna balance our weight, because calorie intake is fundamental. Calories in, calories out, we cannot argue with that. Layer three is understanding your protein intake. Everyone has to understand that at some point because we have a minimum requirement. If you feel that you're eating an omnivorous diet and you generally eat protein at most meals, you're probably gonna be okay. A couple of eggs for breakfast, chicken breast for lunch, a bit of fish for dinner. You're gonna hit a basic protein target very comfortably. But for people that don't generally eat protein as much, you need to have an idea of what that protein looks like. Especially at breakfast, a lot of people don't eat as much protein at breakfast. So I would want a client to start understanding that and tracking that so they can go, okay, three eggs is around 20 grams of protein, brilliant. That's enough for me for a breakfast. We don't have to keep counting that ongoing, but we have to have a, a period of education which we're able to make those changes. So within that level of tracking, Number three is also calories. So A is freestyling, B is overall calorie intake, C is calories and protein, and then lastly is macronutrients. We count our calories and our macronutrients. I use this in about 0.1% of clients. For me, it's detail that most people just do not need, unless they typically under eat a certain macronutrient. So they might have a bit of a fear around carbohydrate, for example, so we start to track it to make sure they're bringing their levels up again, because they might be highly active, or this individual is highly active. They might be a triathlete, for example, and they need to be eating 45, 50, 50% of their diet as carbohydrate. So I need to know that they're getting enough of that in their nutrition. But otherwise, it's one step too far with the detail for a lot of people, and it creates a lack of flexibility. Imagine getting home and your coach has said, right, your meal should be 30 grams of protein, 40 grams of carbohydrate, and 28 grams of fat. You've now got to try and build a meal in your kitchen out of those numbers. That's a maths lesson most people don't want. So I try and get it to a client, walks in at home for dinner, and says, right, I need to eat 600 calories for dinner. I know that my meat portion, let's say it's a chicken breast, has got around 30 grams of protein in it, and it's got 150 calories, awesome. And then I just make the rest of my meal up out of the carbohydrates, fats, vegetables, and stuff that's gonna go in it. That's such an easier way, and trust me, the outcome will be virtually the same. Now, there's one benefit that's probably totally irrelevant to you girls with tracking consistent macronutrient intakes, apart from being highly athletic and needing to do that, it generally maintains a certain level of look or leanness. So a lot of physique people will generally eat the same level of macronutrients a day or cycle it slightly because it ensures you look the same. But unless you're really lean, you'll never see that. So if you ladies were all like 10, 12, 13% body fat, which is very low for a female, if you ate high carb one day and low carb the next day, you would see that you looked leaner one day and significantly not leaner the next day. Only because carbohydrate pulls water into the body. So that's the only really other reason. It's not relevant for most people. So with all of that jumble that I just went through, hopefully you can start to see a bit of a system that maybe you need to adopt to allow you to have the adherence, the flexibility, and the sustainability. And it might be that you move from one level to the next. You start off, as most of my clients do with A, we just try and eat good food, get into good patterns, start to listen to our body, and appreciate good meals. Then we might drop into level three tracking, where we understand our protein intake and our calorie intake, and then we go back up to either A or B, and we just stay there, we just cruise. So I'll give you an example. I live my life in level B tracking. So I track my daily calorie intake, and that is it. I eat enough protein, I know that. I'm an, I'm an avid omnivore. So I know I eat enough, I don't need to track it. So really all I need above and beyond that is my overall calorie intake, which is generally between three to 3,600 calories a day, quite active. So I just make my meals up from that. 
Now the other thing that's quite important to do is, well as you looking at the pattern that's gonna work for you and the type of system that you would use, is looking at your lifestyle and where it's be best place to put these meals. The reason why I bring that up is especially in London, there's a big kind of social aspect around food. So one of the things I like to do is I like to try and eat light throughout the day, eat as kind of minimal amount of calories as I can, and then I save a lot of it for the evening time. I've eaten out four times this week. I'm on the road a lot, I'm doing all sorts of stuff, meetings, all kind of things. So I go out for dinner a lot. So one of the ways that I use to help me maintain my weight is I eat really light throughout the day, and sometimes I fast, I quite enjoy that. And then that means when I get to dinner, I might have like 1,500, 2,000 calories to play for. Still in calorie balance, but it works for my lifestyle. You might be someone that's really active in the morning, so it might be prudent to eat a bit more of your food intake earlier on in the day. Otherwise, you might get a bit wobbly, a bit woo-woo, and eat a bit lighter during, during the later part of the day. You might be someone that really hates going to bed on an empty stomach, a uh, heavy stomach, sorry. So again, you might have a light dinner. You might be like me. I love to have a belly full of food when I go to bed. That's just me. So start to think about what I've said so far. I'm gonna hand the microphone out in a minute, so if you've got a question, I'll pass it around. So where do we start? Your standards have to be here. We have to take ownership out of, sorry, ownership with every one of our problems and the way that we think. And if you think you'll struggle with that, you think, right, what resource do I need to help me change? I'm not gonna say that you're gonna walk out of this door from this talk having all the answers to the problems. But I just want you to be able to identify the potential problem and where the solution might lie. It might be that I've written a blog or a podcast or something that can help, or it might be that you need to go and look at a bit of Alice Living's work or who knows, or a certain book to help you with that part of the journey. But where there's a blocking factor, you have to go and grab that resource so you can knock that blocking factor in the face. Because that's the thing that's stopping you from moving forward. So it's really important. Then we start to look at our lifestyle, what we want out of it, what we do exercise-wise, and really find our level of balance. Right, before I talk too much and use up all my time, who would like to ask a question? You can make it relevant to what I've already spoken about. You can go off in a tangent, I do not mind. There is a hand, let's go. To start with, so what, what people are really good at is not learning from the actual process they're going to, and I'm not saying you are or you aren't. So people might start count, counting calories, right, I need to eat 2,000 calories a day, awesome. And they start logging it all in my fitness pal, and they're just doing the thing rather than going, right, this thing that I'm doing, what outcome is it leading to? So rather than building a meal and going, yeah, that was 600 calories, yeah, sweet, my fitness pal, and eating it, just stop for a second and go, okay, that was 600, okay, there was that much protein in that, okay. And then you look and you make an association between the meal that you've created, the data that you've inputted. So you now start to build your fitness library. Because what happens is when we start using that tool or that process that we're going through, we're then lost. We haven't actually learned anything. So I run a 90 day program called Fat Loss for Life. And literally every day I'm saying to my clients, these processes that I'm going to, I need to knock you around the head with them because you're not meant to just passively go through them, you're meant to learn from every step of the process. Because after 90 days, I'm not there anymore. You're designed to go out and do it on your own. So with kind of your calorie example, I would raise the question or say, right, if we're calorie counting right now, and let's say we need to eat 2,000 calories, have we taken enough knowledge from the process of understanding what maybe a 600 calorie meal looks like, 500 calorie meal, etc., etc. Because the reality is most of us eat very similar meals most of the time. We don't actually have that much diversity in our nutrition, unless you're a real foodie. I eat the same sort of 10 to 12, to 10 to 12 meals literally every week. And I'm fine with that. 
but I've identified with a lot of those patterns. So, you know, let's say you ate the same breakfast every day, which loads of older people do. Like my granddad, porridge mate. That's it, not eating anything but porridge. So I could say to my granddad, okay, granddad, weigh out that porridge and then weigh out the milk. Oh, okay, that was 480 calories. He makes the same thing every day. It's now logged, boom. We already know that section of the day is sealed up. So I think it's about knowing what those foods look like in terms of actual portions. So you can start to look at a meal, even if you went round a friend's house, oh, they've served this, that kind of looks like 700 calories, because I know what's in chicken, I kind of know what's in this, and it gives you a good ability to guesstimate. The weight loss and weight gain is a bit tougher, because you are really gonna freestyle, and someone that's a fairly low body weight, which some of you are, it could be the difference of like literally two, 300 calories, which is make or break in you, you know, loads of these snack bars in here are two, 300 calories. So that's the difference between you losing weight and not. So it could be tough. One thing I like to ensure when someone's on a freestyle fat loss journey is that their approach to exercise is not too aggressive. The more aggressive your approach, so if you're doing a lot of hip classes, boot camp, spinning, that kind of stuff, if you're under eating too much, you're gonna burn out so quick. You're gonna become a mess. So it pays to track when you want to work hard. Because if you under eat, you're going to die. With kind of gaining weight, again, it's sort of like how body conscious you are. The more conscious you are of the small changes, you're probably going to want to track. Like, I used to be obese. I don't want to get fat again. Simple as. So I track as much as I can with what I'm happy with to make sure that I'm never straying too far and I'm quite happy with that. I don't think I'm overly restrictive. Like, I follow 3,500 calories a day, I do it in my iPhone calculator, it takes me about a minute a day, I'm quite happy with that. No, I use my, I use the iPhone calculator. So I literally open the calculator, I might have a 500 calorie breakfast and I literally put 500 into the calculator. I might have an apple, 80, might have lunch, right, plus 650, it's literally how I track my daily calories into it. Don't get me wrong, it's easier for me to understand what's in food a lot more and I can kind of guesstimate a lot more. It's as simple as that. So I like people to learn, get geeky, get anal, break away, and then use something like this. It's just really simple. But ultimately, the proof will always be in the pudding. So if you're tracking a certain amount and listening, if you get to the end of the week and you're like, man, I've lost a pound, you know that maybe you need to take away a snack or stop adding maybe as much oil with cooking or something simple like that. Who's got a question? Yes, pass it over. What are your thoughts on weighing daily? Uh, I don't really personally think anything positive can come out of it, ever. Um, I know there's some coaches that talk about it. I mean, I haven't weighed myself for about eight years, literally. When people ask me how much you weigh, I still say 83 kilo. I have no idea if I'm 83 kilo. Um, I'm not bothered about it. I'm bothered about the way that I look and feel, 100%. You know, I would ask what you expect to see with weighing someone daily. So if I had a client that's on a weight loss journey and I expect them to lose two pounds in that week, if they weigh themselves a day after they've started, what emotion are they gonna feel? It's not gonna be positive. So I would usually say like once a week maximum, if not once every two weeks, four weeks. Because I really want people to create an environment where they're always in this state of positive momentum. It's like when I break down the goals for a client, like we might say, okay, I need to lose four stone. Sweet, that's the end goal. And no point now we're gonna focus on that. Because most people come to a coach having got to a place they're not happy with. So I got to a place where I got to 16 stone as a 10 and a half stone natural weight male. So if my coach said to me, do you know how to lose five and a half stone, Ben? I'd be like, no, no flipping idea. So straight away, if he allowed me to focus on that 5.5 stone weight loss, I would be totally disempowered because I have no idea how to do it. But if he said to me, right, the average weight, uh, weight loss rate in most people is around two pounds. That's healthy. Do you think you know how to lose two pounds? You'd be like, yeah, I could go out for a run, I could cut out crisps. Like straight away, people know how to drop a few pounds. 
So it's an empowering process. So we might have this weight loss goal of four stone, but I say to my client, all we're gonna focus on this week is two pounds. So that when we stand on the scales on Monday, we've lost two pounds. All I hopefully have to say to you is, what do you reckon we need to do this week? And hopefully you'll say to me, we'll just do the same thing. We've just done it, just do it again. And that's important because it's, it's motivation. And we can go, well, I already know how to do that. I'm patting myself on the back rather than going, oh, I'm so part of yeah, pretty much so let's just carry on. And that's all about you being aware of how you think and feel about yourself and the journey and the process and the environment because we are all different. We all think differently. We've all got to set up our environment in the right way to lead to the best outcome. Who has a question? Go on, leave your money's worth, Gil. Yep. So I find that typically I'll be really good Monday to Friday and then weekends I do just like burn out. So I'll go eat good, I'll go to the gym, weekends, not so much, go off plan. How can you break out of that kind of cycle? So firstly, you've got to plan better. So if you know you want to go out and have fun at the weekend, plan how you're going to manage and mitigate the damage. So I just went to Athens on a rugby tour and I got a shit face for three days. Drunk a lot, ate a lot, all sorts. The three days after that, I was like, right, all I'm gonna eat for the next three days is like a bit of chicken, bit of veggies, loads of water, literally reset from those three days. That's an extreme example. So if you're gonna go out for dinner tonight, let's say you're gonna go around a mates for barbecue, I would have liked to, you to have looked at maybe the first half of today. What could I have done to mitigate my maybe uh, impact on my calorie intake so that I can account for that. Same with the Sunday, you might be like, oh, I had quite a bit to eat last night. Um, I'll eat a little bit lighter today. And like, I would ask your grandma what they would have done in this situation. Like, my grandma always used to say, we sit down at dinner time, like, oh, grandma, you're not eating much tonight. No, I had a big dinner. Like, common sense, right? I had a big dinner, have a light dinner. So, it's kind of planning is the first thing, expecting it. The reason why I want you to plan is you start to make very different decisions. So if I was gonna go out and have dinner tonight, or I'm going home, I'm gonna have a barbecue. I'm gonna to go to that barbecue and already in my head, I'm gonna be like, right, well, I'm gonna have two beers, then that's it. And then I'm gonna have a fatty meat, lean meat, and loads of vegetables and a bit of bread. I already kind of half know what I'm gonna have because it serves me and my goals. If I don't do that, people are very susceptible to their environment what other people are doing. And it stands to reason because you haven't got a plan. So someone else is gonna make your plan for you. Do you want a glass of wine? Yeah, I've just made these bits of cake or whatever. Oh, I made this, do you want this? And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've just got no idea what's going on. So the first thing is you've got to plan. Second thing is you need to maybe look at your week and ask if your week is so extreme in its health approach that it forces you to want to do whatever you want and break free at the weekend. So it might be that you, everything you eat during the week is just like golden and you restrict everything. And actually midweek, maybe you need a glass of wine midweek or a bit of chocolate or a bit of whatever you want because you are getting to the weekend going, all the wine. So I can say today, being on the stools a bit, yep. I've treated myself to a lot of stuff. So when I go out later... You haven't treated it, you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it, yeah, I've enjoyed it. So now I know my plan later is to just go a bit lighter. That's all I need to say in my head is my plan. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then my second question is, with exercise, so you mentioned about hit. So I basically do a lot of hit all the time. And then I'm always wondering, do I need to do that thing where everyone goes, I'm training shoulders today or it's leg day or whatever. So like tone down the hit and then focus on different body parts or should I focus? Because I do actually like doing hit, but can you, is that an exercise that you can overdo and tie yourself out? Sure, so for me, exercise should serve two or both purposes, it should be fun, so whatever you enjoy, do it. Secondly, it should be purpose driven. So if you literally just want to be happy, healthy, lean, strong, fit, I'd go back to fun and just do fun. 
Yeah. yeah. So the reason why people go into the gym and do a shoulder workout is they want bigger, stronger shoulders. Yeah. If you don't want bigger, stronger shoulders, don't do that. But what I will say about HIT is we need to be careful with the dosage of that HIT. HIT in its truest sense, I mean no one does HIT in its truest sense. Scientifically, HIT is basically balls out training so hard that you can't really do it more than four or five times. And that means about a minute to two minutes of total exercise. HIT isn't a class where you're jumping around, all that kind of stuff. It's not actually high intensity training. So you need to analyze the level of conditioning that you're putting your body through and can you recover from it? Because if you're getting to Friday, Saturday, and you're like, doms all over the place, like there's no muscles left to be sore, and it's kind of like your level of well-being has just been zapped, you know you're doing too much. So most clients, I'll say, train aggressively three, maybe four times a week then choose some lighter options. Go for a run, a swim, a walk, a yoga, or whatever, because you've got to balance all of that. It's just like an athlete. An athlete will go through periods of brutal training, and then they'll take three, four, five, six days off to recover. They'll do a little bit of active recovery, and then that's it. Because they know that they keep going, can't keep going at that rate. But the problem is, is we're pattern-based creatures. And Monday to Friday, we do the same shit every week unless we go on holiday. So literally, Monday's X day, Tuesday's this, Wednesday's that, and we just repeat the cycle. But we never actually say, actually, I've been at this for four weeks, I'm pretty tired. I might just have a week off. And I just walk and stretch and enjoy things. And I just think sometimes we need to snap out of it. And the worst that happens if we stop exercising for a week is we need to eat and get you won't get fat yeah. if you control what you eat. Yeah. I'm lucky that I, I do it, I, I take time off quite a lot. So I, when I'm at home and I'm not traveling, I train as hard as I can. And when I go travel, I literally don't worry about it. So I went to Greece, I did train for two weeks. Um, because it's a ball lake fun, the gym, I can't be arsed. Like, I trained really hard, so I'm doing a rest. But I planned that. I looked ahead and saw what was coming and just programmed the days. This week I already know where I'm going to train because it's where my gaps are. And then the rest of the time I'm like, cool, I'll just try and get my steps up and eat well. Anyone else got a question? How much time have I got left, boss? Five minutes. Hi. Uh, just going back to the, if you're eating out or no, you can have a pizza or whatever to eat lunch on the day. That's something I struggle with because I'm super active. I'm a dog walker. So I walk loads of day. Yeah, so I'm going to get really geeky. Describe to me exactly what you did. Literally how you ate. Can you think of a day, literally what you ate and how you did it? As in normally to or how no, I went lighter? No, how you went lighter. Um, I just, I generally eat like three meals and two snacks, so I just try to cut down the amount of meals I eat. Yep. Or just like put down the calories in the meal. Sure. So describe to me three of the meals. Sounds like your diet, just from what you said, is quite low in protein. Is it? Would you say? I'm Are you? I'm vegetarian, so I'm really mindful trying to get protein. Sure. Um, I would think that would help you a lot. I think it would improve your satiety. It's one of the main benefits of protein. Um, I think you then need to play around with potentially some meals that keep you fuller for longer. So you work on keeping calories a bit lower and really increasing food volume, food uh, fibre volume. Um, I also think it's important to practice bringing your food down. Because if you're used to having a 600 calorie breakfast, and you go to a 300 calorie breakfast, it's quite a big shock. So maybe it's time, just like one week you bring it down a bit, bring it down a bit, bring it down a bit. Because you always need to practice and teach your body how to handle a small amount of food and how you might change that variable. One of the things I do is I leave my first meal as late as possible. As soon as I start to get a little bit hungry, then I'll eat. Because again, that helps me push my calorie intake back. Um, they'd be the key things that I would try. It is tough because you, you're, you're literally on your feet all the time. But I would still be playing around with the types of food that you're eating and how it's making you feel and filling you up. 
probably got time for one more question. Yes, sorry. Did see your hand up. Um, you mentioned before about when, Keep the sorry, um, when you do the same thing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you kind of got the same routine. Did you eventually start to have a note? Does your body kind of get used to that if there's a negative effect to doing that? Or is it fine to kind of do the same thing if you're okay with it? Sure. The only way that the body would negatively react to that is if you literally trained at the same intensity. So if you were a runner and you went for a five mile run and you ran the same pace for five miles for months and months and months, your body will start slowly burning less calories because you become adapted to that intensity. It's not huge, but it's there. Um, so in short, no, I don't think so. I think as long as you're still progressing in your training, then you'll be absolutely fine. That was a quick question. We've got time for one more, boss? Two minutes. Get your money's worth. I do a lot of training, and I struggle with fatigue. Yeah. Um, I struggle with fatigue more if I have an event coming up. Yep. Because I'm so focused on what I eat and when I exercise, but when you need to bulk up, I, I can't. Okay. So, in 99% of the cases, I generally find that people are more worried about eating more than actually physically eating more. I think it's so easy to eat more. Don't know about you, but I love eating food. <laughs> so, it might be that your ta tactically, your food choices have to change to become more calorie dense. So you might need to be using more oils, more denser carbohydrates, putting... Yeah, so do you track your calorie intake and your energy expenditure? You, you do know. So you have to ask why you're still having a battle in your head when you know that you potentially need to eat hypothetically 400 calories more per day because you're training like He-Man. So, I think that's more of a question for yourself of where that block comes from. I think you also need to give yourself a chance to see how your body responds to it. Because if you're always pulling back, you're almost never seeing how your body can perform. And this is why anyone that I coach long term and someone gets down to a body composition they're sort of happy with, I then say, you need to learn to eat as much as humanly possible without getting fat. The more you can eat, the better your body will perform, especially if you are an athlete, the way that you train you're an athlete. So you've got to eat as much as humanly possible. But the reality is, is if you're tracking things slowly, you can see these small changes. But what some people do is they're like, oh, I need to eat more, and they go and eat like a massive bowl of pasta. Then you wake up the next day and you're all like soft and watery. It's nothing to do with the calories, it's the fact that you end up eating an extra 200 grams of carbohydrates and your body wasn't used to it. And it's just stored a load of water, which will probably go like the next day. So this is where when you are very active, you do need to track the variables quite closely. Um, so I think you need to maybe test yourself, see what your body can do by eating and fueling more. And if you are still, I would work with a coach for three months and get him to force you to make those changes and have the guidance and care of him and his expertise. Right, I better wrap up. Um, I'll hang around for five minutes if anyone wants to say hello and stuff. Uh, then I'll be in the car to get to the barbecue and have a pint. <laughs> have a good day, everyone. Whoa, just before you go, a couple of things. Firstly, if you need my help at any point in time, reach out to my Facebook fan page, ask a question, and I'll get back to you. The reason I like my Facebook fan page is because I can send like voice memos back, and it's really time efficient for me to be able to help as many people as possible. If you want to find out just anything I'm up to, keep abreast of social media, make sure you're on my email newsletter, and all of that info is at bencoomer.com. If you want nutrition education in the future, then have a look at the BTN Academy. That's our online nutrition courses. If you want to be coached by me, then join my 90-day body and mind transformation program, Fat Loss for Life. And if you're looking for clarity, honesty, simplicity, and research-proven supplements that taste awesome, then go to awesomesupplements.co.uk. That's my links. That's where to find me. That's where to find the cool stuff. I'm out. Have an awesome day. Hey, everyone. Thank you for radio. Right. So remember when we've talked about shows before and we've talked about personal development?